All right, hey uh, everyone, uh, my name is Greg Catano. I'm one of the partners with Chris Crisitelli and VR Fest. And welcome to the fifth annual Virtual Reality Festival. And thank you for getting here right on time. So thank you for being here. I know it's a sparse crowd, but we really appreciate you being here right for the first panel. So today I wanted to introduce, oh, actually I um, wanted to give thanks to our sponsors, one being Hologate and the other Alienware. So thank you for your sponsorship of VRFest. And today we're gonna introduce the first panel with Bob Cooney. Bob Cooney is a dear friend of mine. He's one of the foremost experts in virtual reality, uh, location-based entertainment, and um, everything, what, um, family entertainment. So one of, the, one of the bigger consultants, he's consulted for Hologate, uh, for um, zero latency, and he also has a new book that um, he's just put out, and it is Real Money from Virtual Reality, so be sure to pick that up from Bob, and he's also a writer, he's um, a well-followed writer in the space, so thank you for all your contributions for virtual reality. And uh, yeah, cool. round of applause. And over here we have Tarney Williams, and uh, Tarney's with Blueprint Reality, and he's going to speak about your technology, your platform, which is a mixed reality platform. And um, could you tell, tell me a little bit, bit about it? Yeah, we're just going to talk about the mixed cast platform. Mixed cast and in platform. particular, mixed cast moments, uh, something that we're showing on the floor in uh, Intel's booth at CES. So uh, come by and get your, be the star of your own 90-second virtual reality trailer. Perfect. So um, we're going to kick this panel off, and uh, thank you both of you for uh, for starting our first panel off. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Greg. Hi, Tarni. Hi, Bob. Thanks How are for, you? I'm I'm doing really good. I'm really good. So we are coming to you live, uh, and we're streaming live. So everybody out there that's watching, we're at Planet 13, which is the America's largest weed dispensary, which I think is hilarious. Yeah, well, um, we're on the non-dispensary side. We are on the event. Yeah, it's also yeah. an event space, which is really funny. And we thought we would do one of those like wake and bake Joe Rogan and uh, Elon Musk podcasts, but they ixnade that. So no, I don't smoke a, weed. Yeah, though, no, exactly. So I, I wouldn't know how to plan. do it anyway. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so, so I want to talk, before we get into the technology, Tarni, I want to talk a little bit about what is mixed reality. There's a lot of conversation debate around, like, what is it in the terminology, MR, XR, AR, blah, blah. Um, so what is mixed reality from your perspective? And then we'll get into why it matters. Sure. I think, uh, as you said, there's so much terminology in the space that it is incredibly complicated to navigate. And, you know, mixed reality as a term has been used for a wide variety of things. But I think it, you know, the best definition of it that I like at the highest level is that it's when you're mixing virtual things and you know, real visual things at the same time. So that could mean augmented reality where you're overlaying you know, digital images over top of the real world. In our case, we're doing more like augmented virtuality where we're taking real people, visual images of people, and overlaying those onto virtual scenes. And so you know, in our particular parlance, mixed reality means you know, essentially using a, an exterior camera to do a background removal of a person. We you know, align the coordinate spaces of the real world and the virtual world, and then you know, essentially create a video, uh, an output to 2D, so someone outside of VR can see essentially the context and the situation and the experience that the person in VR is experiencing as they experience it. Yeah. Cool. And so I've been, you know, I've been a big proponent the first time I saw this. Um, one of the biggest challenges has been in VR is setting the context for the user. And it's been, you know, I've heard it referred to as trying to convince somebody to do VR is like trying to sell somebody television over the radio. Right? It's one of those things that if you haven't done it, you just don't get it. And so how do you get people to try it? And, and one of the things I love about mixed reality and, and specifically what you guys are doing at Mixcast is that like, it becomes really crystal clear what the experience is. Because like, you see the person, all these VR videos that you see are are um, you know the first person view, and so you know it's like watching a, a Twitch stream of CS:GO. And if you're not a CS:GO player, you just don't get it, right? Well, and, and you don't have any idea as a viewer that it's actually virtual reality. So I mean, you, you know, normally you get two choices: that first person view, or you see a person with a you know the bucket on their head waving their arms around, and that's not really compelling content. It's not compelling social media share content. It's not compelling marketing content. And neither is the eye texture because it just looks like. You had a really bad cinematographer, you know, in a first-person shooter, uh, record your marketing video, yeah. and that's that. You're not going to get hired. And so, and so, the key is getting, you know, setting that concept and showing somebody actually in VR from a third-person perspective 
port, you know, transported into that virtual environment having fun is kind of the first step. And that's where you started, right? Absolutely. I mean, we started really just wanting to be able to make this possible and be able to create the potential for, you know, anybody, you know, to, with a modicum of effort, find an easy way to do this. Because, you know, there's a, there's a way you can do it using Steam and Unity, but it's hard. You know, and so we built a platform that makes it a lot easier. And so we've been iterating on that platform to continue to, to make it easier and easier as we go. And now we sort of started moving into, like, how do we actually help people make better content that ends up, you know, being more likely to be distributed and of more value, not just the technology behind the content. Yeah, and so, and so those of you, I'm sure if you're watching this or you're in the audience, you've seen Beat Saber um, and you saw a lot of the mixed reality videos that were on YouTube last year showing Beat Saber. And, you know, and it was interesting and it was cool and it's kind of a competitive game so people were watching it. Um, but we should, we should probably get to the video at some point to show people how you've taken that to the next level. Because this is really about storytelling, right? Absolutely. You know, I mean, that's my background. I've got 30 years as a games producer, uh, you know, 16 of those at EA, building things like Medal of Honor and, you know, went to Relic and was executive producer at Company Heroes. And, you know, I've done lots of that. So my background's more in that area. And it's nice to now be kind of moving into that space as we have built the technology, we built the platform, we built the distribution system, and now we're getting to move into the like, okay, how do we now make some great content and do yeah. some great storytelling? So why don't we? Yeah, let's show, we show, let's show you. We got a short video that'll show it to you rather than us sit. <laughs> I would have gone girl from Ipanema, but that's just me. Is that and so now everybody doing a VR experience can actually have that done with a minor integration right yeah so that you know we worked with toast uh, you know, the creators of Richie's plank experience and currently this is running on the floor in Intel's booth uh, we're an Intel partner and essentially we did uh, we did 114 of these yesterday because they're automated it does all the cuts automatically uh, depending on what the person does, whether they fall off the plank, whether they fly around. Um, we, once it's done, we concatenate all the videos, we insert the pre-rendered shots, we lay the audio in, we lay the mic track in, and so everybody gets their own custom-made, customized experience. And that gets delivered to a touchscreen kiosk. And, and when you say you lay all that stuff in, I want to make sure you, I mean, that's, that's actually... It's all automated. It's not, you, nobody, you're nobody not doing Nobody does anything, it. no. And so literally, you know, we were doing a person every four minutes, They'd come in, they'd do their experience, and then they'd leave, and then they'd get their video. It would show up 15 seconds after they finished their experience, after we've processed everything and assembled it all. Um, and it was, it was great. People loved it. Uh, you know, we had some incredible reactions. I think, uh, you know, you sort of hear, uh, he's one of my producers, so, you know, he's done it a few times in this particular video, but you hear reactions way crazier than him. I mean, you know, I would say probably one in five people would not go out on the plank. Like, I can't do it. Ah, there's no way I'm going out there. You know, we had one guy 
uh, who was flying around and like he just wiped out. I mean, he took out our light and our monitor and he was and he was laughing his head off. And we're like, oh my God, are you okay? He's like, oh, I'm fine, it was great. Like, is your, how's, your, how's your monitor? It's okay, I hope it didn't break anything. Um, you know, and so it was uh, really, really fun to be able to, to take people through these experiences. And we're showing it live on a monitor and it cuts back and forth on the monitor as well. We're not showing the insert shots and stuff, but you know, we had a line two, three to four, people deep, which is about all the space there is in our area most of the day, because people were watching essentially this, this what looks like a live director-led uh, you know, show the whole time. And that's, and that's the key. So if you're building a, you know, uh, any kind of an experience, for, especially for location-based um, VR, I believe this is going to become table stakes. Like, like this is going to become an absolute baseline requirement for all location-based VR experiences sometime late, late this year. Like it's gonna take a little bit of time to catch on, but um, it, because the biggest challenge that when I talk to VR arcade operators, and I've talked to hundreds of them, um, their biggest thing is how do I get more people in? How do I create social content that is engaging? And you have to be able to amplify that, which means you need to be able to get your customers to find things that they like that they can amplify. And this is the thing, because it makes you wanna do it, right? You watch that video and you're like, oh shit, I wanna do that. And so, automating that through a whole bunch of games in an arcade and then having that shared out tens of thousands of times is really gonna be the key to, I think, the industry finally getting traction and, and, and driving revenue. Yeah, I mean, that's, we think so too. It's why we built it in the first place, was something to really, because we believe it helps the industry. Because if you don't have something like mixed reality, you have no idea what the person in VR is doing. And it's just not contagious. And if it's not contagious, it's not going anywhere. And, you know, we have uh, plugins for Unreal and for Unity, for SDKs, and have now built the full end-to-end -end platform, cloud distribution, touchscreen portal, account management kiosk with, you know, multiple logins and permissions and, you know, everything that you do with an enterprise-level portal. So that's up. It's running. Anybody who's interested in, uh, you know, doing this with their product or, you know, uh, LBE or whatever, uh, let us know. What other verticals does it, does it work for? Um, you know, it'll work for almost any vertical where you feel like it's important to be able to record a quality content uh, of an experience. So that could be an education and training, it could be, uh, we actually you know, have, have a number of people in the education space using it for a variety, like just the general mixed cast platform, not necessarily the full automated uh, how, how would they use it in education? I'm really interested in VR and education. Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting things in general about the mixed reality part and essentially being able to have multiple cameras as well, is that you can now, as an educator, be able to show something in VR to an audience outside of VR and not just with the headset texture. So they can see the context of what you're interacting with. Because of course we're tracking hands or we're tracking controllers, we're able to show them holding and interacting with virtual objects. So you're talking about distributed education outside of the classroom. That's so, correct. Or even in the classroom going, if you right? don't have everybody in a headset. Like, you know, it's not like Good schools point. can buy a headset for everybody all the time. Like that's, you know, they haven't quite figured out the pricing on all of this stuff yet, especially at the higher end. And so you can have a much smaller ratio of headsets to people who could actually be watching it, because we can do live streaming as well. You know, class, local and distant, could all be watching, you know, essentially multi-cut uh, live content of somebody interacting with something virtual. Cool. Um, where does it go from here? Like, what's wh what's the the what's the future of this type of like mixed reality streaming context setting from an application standpoint? Like, what should customers or or developers or operators look for in the future? Sure. I mean, I think everybody's already looking for low operator overhead, and so that's you know a key area that we focused on is how do we make sure that this is as easy to set up as possible and once you've set it up it runs with essentially no operator involvement or as low operator involvement as possible. So obviously we always continue honing that. Uh, you know one of the holy grails people always want is uh, headset removal, facial replacement. So you know that'll be something that comes down the pipe pretty fast. And what you mean by that is like literally so then the headset doesn't even show up. So how would you do that? You basically do it with you know head scans or pre-done uh, footage, I don't know, those of you who are familiar with the internet have probably seen things like deep fake or everybody dance now and there's a lot of facial replacement stuff already going on through machine learning. Uh, we've been running a machine learning group since September uh, doing you know, a variety of different scene analysis and starting to get into that area. But you know, you can, Google's actually done some interesting work in the area where they've, they've shown some videos of doing kind of a headset replacement and putting, filling it in. And obviously HTC just announced uh, you know, the Vibe Pro with eye tracking. 
Because the biggest area that you, you know, you get a fail is, you know, is if the eyes are just dead. And uh, I know when we built Medal of Honor Frontline, we added eye movement and some mouth movement to the characters. And, you know, that was a PS2 launch title or whatever shortly after. And when we did that, it really brought the characters to life. And I think a very similar thing happens. Like, we're trying to get the realest you that we can. Fine, you got a headset in your way. Well, if we can get your face in there with eyes that move, we already have your mouth. And so we have other parts of the face that are reacting. I think that makes for higher quality, you know, continues to make higher quality content. And and so from a from a from a upgrade path standpoint, if somebody were to deploy the solution, is that something that's mostly software at that point? Or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's mostly software at that point, especially because essentially the solution that we're we're using in most of these cases is, uh, you know, we use Intel RealSense depth cameras, and so we can do no green screen background removal. I mean, obviously green screen, you always get a higher result, but that that's going to end fairly shortly. Again, partly due to the amount of uh, machine learning that's being applied to, to scene segmentation and background removal, and then really even on the uh, fully you know volumetric capture space, I think both of those will will see you know there's a number of companies specialized in those areas, and you know so for us that'll will be just someone else's solution that replaces that part of it, and the rest of our platform will continue to deliver the storytelling you know, the automation and the ease of use for the uh, the operators. Yeah, I think the no green screen, we didn't hit on that early, but for location-based, that's really critical because operators just don't want those giant, ugly green screens everywhere, and so... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and so that, you know, the quality will continue to improve there, right? I think that's that's sort of been the first area of focus for us with the machine learning is let's get tighter in on a subject, let's remove, you know, any speckling that you get because with the depth camera, you know, they, they're still early in their life cycle of development, and so... You know, the depth isn't 100% steady and constant, depending on your lighting and other things. You can have uh, quality issues. And again, the fastest path that's going to fix that the quickest is definitely on the machine learning side. Yeah, cool. Any questions out there in the audience, which continues to grow? Yay. I have a $20 bill for the first question. Uh, I knew that would help. I'm just lying, <laughs> though, by the way. Sandra? Well, you can yep. just come to the Intel booth but yeah. I think it's, at CES. I, I think it's a great question, which is how much stuff do you need? Like, what is the, what's the, what is it? What's the package? What do sure. you need? I mean, you know, and we, we have several architectures that can work. So, you know, in the Intel booth, we're running it with one PC that has both the experience and mixed cast and our, you know, automated director features all on the same box. We have two RealSense cameras mounted. Uh, and so, you know, each of their $179 cameras. So we have two of those cameras set up. We have two USB 3.0 extension cables. And then we, in this particular case, we're running a 27-inch uh, touchscreen monitor as kind of the kiosk. Is it, that got its own computer? And it's got an Intel Nuke, you know, Nook uh, as, its, as its power source. Uh, you know, and we have it in the office running on uh, about a 24-inch touchscreen monitor with a compute stick. It works on an iPad. It works on an Android tablet. You know, it's it can like it basically we built it so that it can go to any touchscreen. You don't even need a touchscreen on it. You can put it in a PC and it still works because it's all web based. So um, that kind of is how the flow works. And then we can take that and scale it up to you know more of a depending if you're running a location based facility, you may not want to have anything taxing the device that's delivering the VR experience. And so we have you know, the way that we handle the data flow architecture that will allow multiple backtops, you know, with people in those to just be running the experience. And we run each of the cameras on its own compositor box with this, as a spectator camera in that experience. So we don't hit uh, that device. And then we can also run it with, a, with what we call our, our sort of media server. So that as the content gets generated, it can be hosted locally. We can handle multiple, you know, internet bandwidth uh, variables because we can upload thumbnails first out to the kiosk at a lower bandwidth with a very short edited clip. And that all, again, is all built in so that, you know, whether you have higher or lower bandwidth, if someone doesn't want to get their video, then you don't even need to send it up over the wire. So you can, you know, essentially reduce that. We have retention policies and all those sort of things. So, but the minimum is you get a couple of cameras and it, you put it on your VR box um, and you go from there. We so, do, we, so, so the question is, how do you share? How does somebody actually yeah, share? Yeah, right now, them? basically, when they, they, you know, we have a list of uh, the videos that have been generated. They touch on theirs. They enter their email, and we share it to them. From there, they're able to go to that site uh, where they can do direct sharing out to social media from there, and that's built into the site that it lands on. As well, you know, for people who are interested in a full integration, 
we uh, can give them that code and that CSS. We already support, uh, you know, essentially CSS coloration and everything else, so it can be white labeled to be whatever their website wants to look like, even as it shows up. The URL would still be on our site, but we can, if they want to do the integration on their own website, that can be completely contained within their own area, even though it's hitting our servers on the back end. Now, you, when we first started talking about this quite a while ago, you know, there were some concerns about running it on, on the computer that's delivering the experience. How's that been working at Intel? Are they running like a giant supercomputer? Or no, I mean, we're, it's an i9. Uh, okay. you know, and we've, we've done a bunch of optimization with Intel to multi-thread it for i7s and i9s. And so, you know, I mean, if you're running an experience that's absolutely maxing everything out, then fine, we're more load on that machine. And, it, you know, it's the, yeah. the never-ending uh, arms race of building digital content. Uh, you know, I spent most of my career building games, so I'm very familiar with that race. And yep. there's never... There's never enough power. You always want more power. And more power. <laughs> Scotty, um, oh, we got a question. question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a discussion about what seemed to be the early days of the sort of ethic or etiquette of content development. And I was really wondering how you guys have felt maybe like embracing, taking the big look at that a couple of years ago. Is there any sort of lessons around that? At your, and when you say ethics and etiquette of of content, are you talking about like the fact that it's public and we're sh and it's being shared, or what specific? Are you talking about game development and experience development? Well, very playfully, the discussion was at that time a lot of the, the money and income was going into military and foreign. Yeah. And so trying to break away from that, and even in civilian foreign, one of the things um, I was told was that first person experience in VR is much more uh, advantageous. <laughs> <laughs> than a person who tends to be a viewer of a screen, maybe an observer of other people, and can actually you know, be handled differently in the real world versus the game world. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, really interesting question around, around you know, the context of this versus the, the economics of the business models that are coming out where military and porn, you, and I'm just going to grab the porn thing because that's really funny and interesting. Hey, we're in Vegas, and, right? And we're in Vegas <laughs> at a dispensary. Um, <laughs> and I've heard weed and sex go really well together. So Don't know, but um, yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, like, like the porn industry is, you know, really running at VR hard. Have you, no pun intended, um, have you... Have you played around? No, we have not. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know. We have, you know, we have a free version of Mixcast. We have thousands of downloads. It's entirely possible someone out there is creating this type of content. Uh, we are not currently aware of that. Because we're a platform. We're not, we're not just the content creators. And so what people do with the camera after it's purchased is up to them, essentially. But as far as, <laughs> as, far as streaming and sharing, obviously you would probably have some some rules around what you allowed people to stream and share off your platform, right? I mean, because yeah, they can well, buy the camera and do up, their own shit, but... It's, you know, you end up with rights issues always. And so it just depends on, you know, where you end up with those. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to who's actually doing the filming and who's doing the distribution. It's, I don't know, you can, we could spend a, several hours on the legal side of that, yeah. but, you know. Yeah, it's a great question, thank you. <laughs> really interesting for further discussion. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else you want to say, Tarni? Because uh, you know we started late, and yeah. if we can give him back five minutes to no, to I think move we're good. Along, Thank you very so. much for coming. Uh, if you get a chance, again, come by the Intel booth. We're in the central hall. We're in the creator zone uh, there. And uh, what do you have a booth number? You don't need one if it's Intel, it's right? It's Intel. Okay. I, mean, I don't just yeah. And just yeah. It's you go in the central hall, and it's like five times the size of this room. And so is there a way for people? Like, is it a huge wait to get in? Or no? I mean, you know, we've been we've generally had a line two to three deep the whole time, yep. but that generally that is not that long because they're four-minute experiences. So people are waiting four to four minutes or so, cool. and I think. Uh, there's just literally no physical space in that area for it to be much larger of a line, so yeah. you know, I don't think that it would be any larger than that. Cool, and I'll just do a shameless plug. Um, so that's my book, Real Money from Virtual Reality. It's actually about location-based VR and for solution providers that are, or content providers that are looking to move into location-based entertainment. And you can check that out on my website at bobcooney.com and the website for uh, Mixcast. Yeah, it's uh, www.mixcast.me. Awesome, cool. Thanks, Tarni. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thanks everybody. to Chris and Greg, and we're out of your way. All right, Woo. thanks, guys.